Hello, everybody. Welcome back to episode eight of the Old Glory Games podcast. My name is Kyle. And if you can see the screen on YouTube or any video podcast format, you can see this dude right here. I won't tell you who he is unless you know who he is. If you're old school, you know who he is. But we're going to talk about this guy and other guys like him. And unfortunately, some guys who aren't like him, who are I'm labeling the scrawny NBA. So, Greg. What are your thoughts on this? Um, this picture in general, we're laughing backstage on this, but this guy, incredible, right? Yeah. Uh, Larry Nance was for sure a physical specimen. Um, 6'10", could run the floor, long arms, and he could jump out of the gym. And to have a player that size – and I think he won one of those slam dunk competitions. That, that and so you got to understand, the, was it? Yes. Okay. So you got to understand the way the game was played back then versus the way the game is played now. Six ten guys in the NBA in like the sixties, seventies, and even you know the early eighties, you thought of them more like you know these big lumbering guys that you know, would uh, lumber up and down a court and, and you know, post up low and, and do their low post thing. Larry Nance, uh, I mean, he ran like a gazelle, you know, jumped out of the gym, very athletic guy. And he was definitely something that you did not see every day in the league at that point. Now, you started to see more guys like that as the eighties went along, you know, James Worthy, he was like, you know, six, nine, I guess like two twenty, And we all know his game. Even before that, Bob McAdoo, six ten, you know, could jump out of the gym, could shoot, you know, shoot the J he could also work around the rim. So there were some guys like that, but I think today we're more used to seeing guys that size, that could ball, you know, LeBron, 6'8", 250. We all know what he can do. Um, ben Simmons, I don't know that people know. He's like 6'10", but he's a point guard. You know, Magic Johnson, 6'9", point guard. So you're seeing more and more people that size that can – that are very versatile these days. But, you know, yeah. back then, you know, Larry Nance was – kind of like a freak of nature, very impressive, uh, you know, physical skill set. Absolutely. And um, so you sent me a picture, and I haven't, I don't have it queued up yet, but I do want to queue it up at some point, of essentially NBA players today. In fact, I'm going to try and bring it up now, but I think it had Carl Malone in one image of it, and it had another gentleman in it as well from the 90s. I'm sorry? Shaq. It was Shaq. Okay. It was Shaq. Shaq. Oh, yeah. He was he's a monster. And some players today. And so I'm gonna pull up on the screen when I can. But so in the point of this particular podcast is in the in the light of or in the spirit of is the NBA too soft? Is the uh, MLB too soft or whatever? Is the NBA getting too scrawny? And is it affecting the style of play? Is it affecting the quality of the game? Or is it just something we have to deal with because we do? Um, because it's it's more of a nuanced game. It's more of a spot-up game. It's less, like we talked about in our podcast earlier in the series, dealing with the mid, you know, I guess the mid-range jumper. That's no longer a thing. And that came down to analytics and like, why do that when you can do a three? And But when you think about it, there is no difference in the scoring of the points, which we haven't really covered yet. We should probably do a show on the three-point line and how nothing has changed in terms of scoring. It's just lower percentage versus a higher percentage and just more points versus less points. Mm -hmm. It all averages itself out. So anyway, I'm a little bit rambling here, but in terms of all that, in terms of the game, do you think, Greg, that – the players today with this nuanced game, less physical, obviously, is affecting it for the better or for the or for the worse? I, I think it can go both ways. So going back to the picture I sent you, 
it's somewhat shocking to see how very tall and very thin some of these uh, NBA players are today. And I have a list of guys that I went through each NBA roster to find guys that fit a similar mold. So in the picture I sent you, all right, so I'm going to apologize in advance as far as trying to pronounce some of these names. So on the top, you see Carl Malone flexing his muscles and Shaq flexing his muscles. And on the bottom, you see two current NBA players. The one on the left plays for the San Antonio Spurs, uh, a very much heralded young man. He's a rookie this year, I think. His name is Victor, and I'm going to ask for <laughs> forgiveness in advance if I mess up right. some of these names because sure. they're, yeah. they're pretty long. So for the Spurs, Victor Wimbenyama, he's seven foot four. He weighs oh, come on. 210 pounds. I almost got him. Yeah. I almost got him. On the right. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my legs weighs 210 pounds, but right. that's neither here nor there. Uh, on the right, we have Chet Holmgren, seven foot one, 208 pounds. Now, they're not the only okay. two in the league that are built like this. Evan Mobley for the Cleveland Cavaliers, he's listed at 6'11", 215 pounds. Wow. Uh, Dimitro Skapin, Skapintsev for the Knicks, listed at seven foot one, two hundred and fifteen pounds. Wow. Nikola Jovic for the Heat, six ten, two hundred and five wow. pounds. John Butler Jr. for Washington. And from time to time, I still want yeah, to say Bullets, me too. but uh, today it's the Wizards. <laughs> Uh, uh, Wizards, Wizards I'm old sucks, school. by the way. All right. <laughs> yeah. So commanders. Uh, mm. Yeah. The, we, we do a whole nother episode on that for sure. This kid is seven feet, 190 Greg, pounds. <laughs> no, There's seven no feet, way 190 true. pounds. And that, okay, that's okay. what they have him listed as. And oh. the last guy on my list, Santi Aldama for the Grizzlies. Seven feet, 215 pounds. Now, wow. we was, talk a lot about, you know, old school, yeah, NBA. Shaq and was 17, NBA, 300. Let me say first. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the guys at the top, Shaq, depending on what oh day, God. I think in his prime, Shaq was like seven foot one, like what, 300, something like that. Um, Carl Malone, 6'9", 250, 260. I mean, Carl Malone could yeah. play football probably. But these guys here, um, they could be the <laughs> yard markers in football. I mean, seriously. I mean, if they stood sideways, they disappear. It's, it's stunning. Good, <laughs> it's stunning how skinny <laughs> these guys are. But see <laughs> – I mean, I look at us like, come on, guys, eat a cheeseburger. I mean, something, do something. Come on, do some push-ups. I mean, it's it's and to see them play oh, live. Okay. I mean, it's okay. just Greg, they're all I'm arms and legs. Now. I'm like, no other reason to watch these guys. <laughs> I mean, it's just it it boggles the mind. But see, today's game allows players yeah. with this type of build sure. to flourish. There's sure. no yeah, low sense. post game anymore or not like there used sense. to be. There's not much. Yeah. And the and the rules in the league discourage physical play. And that yeah. allows guys like this, they can move around freely, not much resistance. They can right. shoot from wherever they want. So you can be seven feet tall and barely 200 pounds if you can shoot the three, run the floor, and handle, you know, there's nobody like Shaq, Bill Lane Beer, Martin, Mason, Carl Malone, wait in the paint yeah. anymore. Oakley. So these guys, if they can get around the, yeah. the guy that's guarding them, they can just basically waltz uh to the basket. There you you've got to oh, yeah. check this out on YouTube. So yeah. the kid yeah. on the left for the Spurs, 
Uh I think he got a loose ball from half court, took two steps and dunked the ball. That's how long this guy is. I'm going to put this in post. I'll put it in post. I'll put it in in there. You'll see it. I'll look for it and find it. It's like watching a video game. It's like, how in the world did he do that? He took like two long it's like steps a, 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 and dunked NBA the jam. It must be the shoes. You remember that, yeah. you remember that video game? It was He's like a fire. video game type yeah. play. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. But, you know, it, they sure. can be this size and flourish because the rules discourage physical play. You have defensive three-second violations so now. And for anybody that doesn't know what that is, defensive three seconds in the NBA. It's where any defensive player who is positioned in the 16-foot lane oh, the or the area goal. extending four feet past the lane in line must be actively guarding an opponent within three seconds. And the offense is already Hold spread on. from, like, the top of the key. Time Ex- out. Time out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So the old three second rule was if your foot was halfway on the line, even on the line, for three seconds at any point in time, that's called three seconds. What you're saying is you have to be defending somebody for three seconds. Yeah, that that's what the defensive three second rule says wow. now, according to that. what I saw online. You must be actively guarding an opponent within. Um, it says here within. Yeah. Within three seconds, you got to go actively guard somebody within that period of time or they call it. So the way the offenses Mm -hmm. are spread now from like the top of the key to the three point line. Yeah. So with that and three second rule. Wow. Wide open. You you watch an NBA game now. Most of the time, there's nobody in the lane. Everybody (laughs) is like on the perimeter. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's on, hard man. to watch. See, I used to coach me. basketball, and this is ridiculous. So if you can beat your guy Sorry, off the dribble, right? There's sure. nobody there. Who, sure. Who's who's there to stop you? And it's easy for a tall, slender player with skills to get to the rim. Wow! Whenever they want to. Now, if you think about, and we talked about this probably a couple months ago about. NBA yeah. enforcers. Mason. Oh, in 70s. The 70s. Yeah, sure. And I Yeah, and I I I used to get Sports Illustrated when I was a kid. And one of one of the uh one of the uh editions or whatever of that magazine had on the cover the enforcers of the NBA. And I think on the cover it was Maurice Lucas. And if anybody knows anything about Maurice Lucas, he fit that bill very well. So Marvin Barnes, Maurice Lucas, Daryl Dawkins, it, baby. Rick Horn, <laughs> Charles Oakley, they would be lost in today's game because the league frowns upon physical type play and flagrant fouls. It was just a hard foul if it was a foul at all back in the day. But now with the way flagrant fouls are called, you can't knock a guy to the ground. I mean, they, you know, yeah. the Jordan rules, you know, folks that are listening, if you don't know what that is, look that up. But basically the Pistons basically had uh, a mantra when they played the Chicago Bulls. Anytime Jordan gets in the lane, mm-hmm. knock him on his butt. And that's what they did to discourage him from going in there. Now, what did Jordan do? He went and yeah, he, he started lifting weights, and he's like, "Yeah, these guys aren't going to stop me." But you can't that right do there? that anymore. The enforcers on the screen. So, okay, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the one. Yeah, you can't do it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> and he's got his elbow under Dennis Johnson's <laughs> chin. The late great Dennis uh, Johnson. Yeah, boxing out, and yeah, yeah. And back when they actually oh my gosh. boxed out, Greg, we should do a whole show on boxing out. <laughs> or the lack thereof. I mean, oh I gosh. get so annoyed with watching today's game. And I'm yelling, and my wife will tell you, if I yell anything else 
more than box out, I don't know what it is. Maybe stop shooting the three. I'll right, probably right, yell right. that just as much. But these guys today just are just so fundamentally yeah. unsound. Yeah. Boxing out, you don't need talent don't. to box out. You just don't. It's effort. Okay. It's the effort. Next award we're going to give OG Award is going to be for Dennis Robin. That's going to be the next OG Award. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I catch so I catch Keep going. Absolutely. It, yeah. So you, you know, put yourself between uh, your guy and the basket. Um, you know, thank you, thank use you. your rump, use put your arms your back, rump. push that guy thank back, you. get the rebound. Yes. These these <laughs> guys don't have rump, so how are they going to do that? Hey, you're right. Hey. I mean, they, that, hey, they, they wouldn't be you're able right. to do that. Hey. Hey. <laughs> they would, you're right. They wouldn't be able to do that. And you, you just don't see that anymore. It's like the guys just stand there and wait for the ball to drop, and they're like, no, go get it. Put a body oh, on wow. a body. Push the guy out of the way and go get the ball. And you just don't see that anymore. And again, the the way the game is played, it just does not lend itself to that kind of physical right. play anymore. And it goes back to fundamentals. And I've seen my share of AAU basketball. And fundamentals – in AAU is just about non-existent and it drives me crazy. But again, as we've said so many times before, kids do what they see yes. the pros do. If the pros <laughs> travel, that's what they're going to do. Yep. If the yep. pros carry, that's what they're going to yep. do. If the pros do step yep. back jumpers from 30 feet, that's what they're going to do. If they're going to do Euro steps and jump stops, which, Thank you. oh, by the way, is traveling. James Harden. That's what up. they're going to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think somebody <laughs> put up a compilation I've of seen that. Yep. just egregiously bad no calls right. when it comes to traveling. And I'm like, he oh, took eight, nine steps, oh rest stand right there. You no remember? whistle. But, you know, the uh, the fundamental play or the lack thereof it goes all the way up to the pros. So not only do we have less physical play, we also have less fundamentally sound play. And to go back to what you were saying about who shoots mid-range jumpers anymore. It was. There used to be an art to it, but now with a three-point line, that's considered hey, a mid-range jumper is tough. Shot. You try it. You try, you try a 15-footer yes. or a 14-footer. It, Good luck. Well, I, I I tell you what, uh, we played pickup ball a few times uh, years ago when I could still do that sort of thing, and the, the one thing that impressed me about your game, you could pull up from fifteen feet I got. and knock them down, and that's you just don't see that anymore. <laughs> but that's plenty. I can't make a layup. That's no, plenty, no. and you just don't. Oh yeah, well, I mean that's impressive. If, if you can pull up from 15 and knock them down consistently. But yeah, these, these guys today, they can play with that kind of build and physique because it's not a physical game anymore. It just isn't. I mean, there are elements that are still physical, but, and I'll use Steph Curry as an example. I'm sure a lot of the folks that listen are probably Steph Curry fans. I'm not knocking him. But the way he's built, there's no way he'd they, be able to do that in the him. 90s. They would be, uh, yeah, they'd be all over him, knocking him down, knocking him around. But to, but today's rules, he can roam free and do what he wants, basically. Now, I also blame his ability to get off all those shots. He now, he can get off he some can. tough shots. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that he's not guarded because a lot of times he is. But from, you know, during the course of an entire game, defensive intensity kind of wanes in the definitely NBA. liability defensively. And he can start – yeah, he can definitely and has taken advantage of that. But a guy built like Steph Curry today can flourish because of the rules and 
uh, the lack of uh, physicality. So, you know, with the way we're seeing the game play today, it's just so different. And I, you know, just, you know, back in the day a bit, watching teams, you know, run their offense and toss mm -hmm. it in the post and yep. feed the yep. big man and watch yep. those low post moves. And if you're like, well, you know, those are a bunch of big no, old slow so uh, guys that didn't have any that's moves. No, watch, watch a lodge one, pull up, pull up yeah. a tape of him or a video of him. The best Fantastic. footwork I've ever seen for somebody Fantastic. that size, you know, he, his low post game was poetry in motion. So it wasn't just big old lumbering guys that, you know, would set up and just turn around, do a hook shot or whatever. No, watch a lodge run. He was poetry in motion. But today, except for uh, Jokic, when he's got a mouse in the house, he'll back him all the way down from the foul line all the way under the basket. Yeah. Because going back to the size thing, if you want to play small ball and you've got somebody like Jokic, he can take advantage either way. If you're going to play five guards out there and you're going to try to guard him with one, he's just going to basically push them all the way under the basket and score. If you're going to try to put somebody taller on him, he'll just, you know, shoot from three or drive around him or whatever. He's very difficult to guard because he yes. is fund he's big, he's fundamentally sound, and he's skilled. So he is a nightmare to guard. And you just don't see a lot of that <clears throat> anymore. But, you know, again, the the game is such to where and it you you remember when Kevin Durant was a rookie, right? Yes. You remember how skinny he was then? He was listed, I think, like at six eleven, a buck ninety, and they were talking about he couldn't even do one rep uh, on the bench press, and everybody was concerned about that. And you know, I think uh, the team that finally picked him is OKC. Was. I think is who we started with. They're like, we're not going to ask him to do bench presses. We're, you know, we brought him in here to play basketball. It doesn't matter that he can't lift weights. The guy is just yeah. super skilled, and you know, we're picking him to play basketball. But see, over the years, he's filled into that frame a little bit. And I know these younger guys that are just rail thin. They're eighteen, nineteen, twenty year old kids, so they'll fill out some. But in the meantime, I mean, they can get away with being that slender because the game is a lot. Well, less Durant comes from Maryland, music. my hometown. In fact, he played at a school, Montrose Christian, which my school I played for, Grace Brethren Christian. This is way before Durant came. So just you guys who listen to this, we played Montrose Christian and beat the living crap out of them all the time. But the Montrose Christian became a they, – they started recruiting nationally, even though they were directly came from Maryland, and they became a powerhouse um, in, in, in the country. But we were destroyed Montrose Christian. Um, so, But I think Durant came at, at the end er of the era of the big, strong guys. And so he was – people were questioning whether or not he could do it because it hadn't been done yet. But the rules were changing to the point where he was just getting into the air – he was able to um, be kind of like like the tweener, sort of like the joker tight end in football. We have a athletic tight end who doesn't block, but he can catch the ball. You know, kind of like your um, I forget the guy's name who was the Hall of Fame tight end for the Chargers. I forget his name, but anyway, he played for the Miami Hurricanes. His son. thank you, yes, Kellen he, Winslow. That, and even Kelsey really is a is a tweener, and so is um, Gronkowski. Whatever, not yeah. so much in the true sense of joker, but. It's that the frame doesn't fit the tactics of the era of that particular position. In this case, um, Durant came in at the perfect time. So, yep, good analysis. Um, but you mentioned Hakeem Halajawan, um, fantastic. And I will say this um, back in the day, we ran a box and one defense in high school. We won several championships in our Christian league in Maryland. 
but it's a boxing one pressure ball press side of the ball yeah you, you had a chaser and you had whoever was on the side would grab that position and you would double team everyone who had the ball it was a really aggressive style but it had its limitations but if you were athletic you could beat it but if you weren't you were going to get destroyed and that's how we won our, our, our basketball and so from offense standpoint we would do overload left overload right and we'd do sort of thing like that create a triangle situation where the center who are our five position would get the ball but he had to be in a certain location using his feet if he didn't have foot position you can't throw him that rock otherwise you would get the ball stolen or get blocked or you know whatever so the the uh center had to have footwork which is what elijah one absolutely had and i had to appreciate this because i saw these players at the practice you know the the fours and the fives in defense. I'm mean, sorry, in offense, which would be the center or the power forward. They would actually have to stay after practice and work on their footwork constantly because, to me, it seems like it's not a big a skill, but it really is. Because a person's on you, they're putting the pressure on your back. Do you let off that? Do you, does your left foot come off, or do you do you come drop your left right foot back because they're pressure somewhere else, so you have leverage, so you can get the ball because you're trying to get the positioning to get a good shot for a layup and, and the defensive player isn't going to give it to you. So you kind of got to fight for that position and it requires intelligence, footwork and finesse. And I don't think centers get that kind of a, they don't get that kind of appreciation at all in their skill when it's there, but from a defensive, I'm sorry, from a, um, uh, from a person watching it from a, a layman standpoint, you don't see the nuances that are having it happen down low from the big man dealing with the double team, which is mostly the problem most of the time, and dealing with the person with his arm on his back because they could do hand checking back then. And to me, I think Elijah Wan was absolutely brilliant at that because he could take it inside or he could do his, uh, uh, his uh, Elijah Wan shimmy, fake whatever, and then go outside and do a, um, a, a baseline uh, mid-range. So, yeah, I don't think those players get new to the credit as big men down low. They do not. Yep. That's the it. infamous dream shake. That's dream it. shake. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he embarrassed uh, plenty of Hall of Fame level players with that. When the Rockets played Orlando in the, I want to say the 95 NBA finals, and he was going up against Shaq. That was a young Shaq, you know, barely out of LSU. He embarrassed Shaq. I mean, he did whatever he wanted to on offense, and, and Shaq couldn't do anything with him. And that's because of Olajuwon's footwork and skill around the basket. Oh, I He was that. a soccer player. That does fit. So yeah, that explains yeah. the footwork. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. From uh, Nigeria, so he much. played soccer. When, yeah, when uh, the, the Houston Cougars, when they found him, he was very young in the game of basketball. He had only been playing organized basketball for, I don't know, a year or two or something like that, not long. He was very raw when they got him. But the progress he made from the time they got him as a freshman until the time he left after his junior season, leaps and bounds. I mean, it was amazing, and that just speaks to – hard work and dedication to learn, not only get better, but learn the game overall. Cause wow. he didn't grow up playing yeah. basketball, but yeah, he, his skill set as somebody that size was, you know, transcended pretty much because you didn't see centers play like that. No, he didn't. But um, yeah, it's not at all. What I mean, we're seeing, Patrick Ewing tried to yeah, do it. Oh, yeah. He was a cheap imitation. Yeah, Ewing wasn't nearly as yeah. athletically gifted as Olajuwon. I mean, Ewing was was a solid player, Hall of Fame player, but he didn't have the same type skill set as Olajuwon. Now he had some pretty nifty moves around the basket, but he wasn't yeah. nearly as fluid. And by the way, I'm a big Elijah Georgetown Wong fan, was. so I'm a huge Ewing fan. So just just say I'm not I'm not knocking him because I hate him, but I, I love Ewing. 
I'm a huge Georgetown fan. Oh, I understand. Yeah. I mean, Elijah one, you got to give him credit. So, but anyway, let me say this real, real, real quick. I was going to say this. I had one point yeah. I was going to make before Amazing. you were saying, uh, and I, I can be done for this sure. particular podcast, but I got to talk about the N1 culture, right? And, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm going to do my little N1 impression. N1 basically was a league that was street ball, essentially. You can carry, no defense, do what you want to do. It's very entertaining. They had these mixed tapes. It came out in the 90s, whatever, in the early 2000s. And you hear this guy, every time like, yep. I went back away from the microphone, so I won't still be this loud. Oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, here we go. Oh, the spider. Oh, oh, the professor. Oh, baby, oh, and what? It was fun. But it, but when you mentioned about when you mentioned about kids mimicking as a coach at YMCA and one stint at, as associate coach for a AAU team, it was very difficult. It was challenging because you would see and I'm stand up doing this whole and one thing, whatever. The old logo was like it was like you know like carrying the rock up here, whatever. Which Bob Cousy would never have gotten away with that. Right, and, and so they're doing mm -mm. these illegal moves, which kind of have transcended itself into the current NBA. They they can't go this far out, but they can go this far out, and they can walk like you said, your boy the, from the Spurs, two steps from half court, and he's dunking because they don't call a carry. So that culture of athleticism slash Harlem Globetrotters um, has made the game a lot less fundamental, and to me less exciting i agree and you sound just like uh one of those yeah. and one commentators by the way exactly oh, like it. <laughs> it, it the professor <laughs> and spider you know, oh, spider. It, he would hang on the rim and they just do this thing on the rim they call him spider he would like grab both rims and kind of um he would like put both feet on the rim and kind of like hang on the rim whatever <laughs> Yeah, and it, you have so many people ask why, why those guys yeah. couldn't play in the NBA. It's like even in today's NBA, those guys aren't going to let the N one guys <laughs> clown them. There's, they're not going to be right. able to get away Washington with all Generals, that stuff. Washington Generals, Harlem Globetrotters. You know, put, <laughs> oh yeah, putting the ball on their head and then taking it and driving it. You know, just that kind of stuff. It's like yeah, they, they're not going to be able to yeah. do that in the NBA. So no, it. That's just purely entertainment, but in a com purely competitive uh, arena, they wouldn't be able to do any of that stuff. The, even the guys today wouldn't let them get away with it. So it's it's fun to watch, but it's not realistic as far as translating to the real game. But to your point, kids do yeah, what they exactly. see. They try to mimic point. what they see. That's so, the yeah, point. they try to do that's that stuff, and it's like, yeah, that's not fundamentally sound at all. And also, you're not those guys, so you're just going to exactly. turn the ball over. Just exactly. dribble the ball <laughs> the right way and, you know, knock off all the showboating and clowning because that's just going to get us beat with, you know, turning the ball over 100%. and that kind of thing. And by the way, I followed the professor on um, YouTube. I love I love this channel, and he he'll do pickup games with people on the street who think he's a clowner, which he kind of sort of is. And when he plays someone who's really really good, he's challenged, and he he almost loses sometimes. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses, but for the most part, he um, ends up prevailing. But you can tell that he's still a skilled player, just because his handle right. is insane, and. Um, but he just couldn't make the NBA for whatever reason. But, you know, it was just too short or just wrong opportunity, whatever. But he's made a name for himself. But the thing is, is that kids who are 9, 10, you know, they see that and they don't know the difference that what makes an NBA player isn't, you know, the showboating, the, the, the ball on the head or the between the legs, whatever. It's actually much, much more. Um, in fact, if you watch a movie called Hoop Dreams, it's a fantastic film. The documentary came out in the 90s, where essentially, I think it's 92, actually, the same year as Forrest Gump, or 94, by the way, yeah, 94. And it shows, it takes two players and, and, and follows their careers from the time they're, you know, 13 all the way up to high school. 
And what keeps them from the pros, spoiler alert, has nothing to do with basketball. Has to do with grades, has to do with tragedy, home tragedies, has to do with girls, has to do with other stupid stuff outside the basketball court. With all these kids, when they see these players like the professor or like Spider or these guys, they don't understand that that clowning leads to a certain mentality that leads to bad behavior, which leads to not being in the NBA. So I'll let you close out on this, um, Greg. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, um, yeah, tapped out on that. But yeah, I think it's, uh, no, it's 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 all good stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me. It, as as far as the way the game is played today, and I think that's a lot of what we talk about on this podcast. You know, comparing today's game with yesterday's game, and the other thing, and this for many reasons, when we were watching. Uh, NBA basketball, you know, for me, even as uh, far back as the 70s, you know, the 80s and the 90s, those guys were grown men, grown men. I mean, there was no mistaking it. <laughs> exactly. Grown men, <laughs> grown men that you would not want to mess with. Today, you've got 19, 20 year old kids that physically aren't fully developed emotionally aren't fully developed and it's just so different with what you're seeing and with how they play sometimes you got to wonder it's like why in the world did they <laughs> yeah there, there it is why would they do something like that well these are just young kids and yeah again yeah. you know with the rules now where you see kids, you know, one and done, or they're getting them from Europe and other places overseas when they're so young. I mean, you know, they're still to me kids. And when you've got a league now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of, you know, veteran uh, players in the league that uh, are still putting their thumbprint on the game. But when you watch, the NBA now, it's just incredible how young these guys are as opposed to uh, how young they were back in the day. You didn't have a bunch of guys coming out early. If they came out early, it'd be like, you know, their junior year, they might uh, declare for the draft. When you could go to the NBA straight from high school, it was rare that guys actually did it because at that point, you know, they're not physically or mentally ready to jump to the NBA with a bunch of grown men. And I think um, that's a testament to how special and how mentally tough and physically tough Kobe Bryant was to go straight out of high school into the pros. And LeBron James, you know, how he could do that. Not everybody could do it. It's it's It was rare. So you rarely had guys coming into the league that young. So by the time they get to the league, because, you know, back then, um, guys stayed in school. Four years, most of them. So they were grown men or close to it when, you know, from a physical perspective, by the time they got to the league, they were more physically and mentally ready to play. But these days, these kids don't wait. If they have an opportunity to, to go to yep. the NBA and make that money, that's what they do. And I think the game as a whole suffers because you have kids that don't stay in college to get that instruction that they need. You know, they may they probably play the AAU circuit. And Kobe was not a oh, fan really? of AU, by the way. And, you know, for very good reasons. And, you know, may have developed bad habits there or just not as fundamentally sound. And by the time they get to the NBA, quite frankly, a lot of these kids aren't ready. And when you get to the NBA, you know, I'm not an NBA player by any stretch, but um, from what I hear and from what I've seen, the pro coaches, they're not going to take a whole lot of time walking you through fundamentals that you should already know. 
So, you know, from that perspective, the game has kind of suffered. And also for the player, you know, they may get a little frustrated because it's like, oh, well, you know, I, I came in thinking I'm going to, you know, uh, set the league on fire right away. They may sit a few years. And it's like, well, if you stayed in college, you'd be more ready. But on the flip side, you know, they're making they're they're making that money. But to go back to uh, what this segment is all about, these kids, you know, they entered the NBA much earlier. They're not physically mature, but it's not a hindrance like it would have been years ago because the rules are such to where physical play is discouraged. So they can come right in and make an impact, even at seven foot four, 210 pounds. It's uh, kind of stunning to watch, but to their credit, these kids have figured it out and figured out how to make the current rules work for them. And in flashes, it's entertaining. But, you know, I really don't want to see a game where it's basically run up and down the floor, pass the ball around, and shoot threes. And that's what the NBA is for me today. So I don't watch as near as much of it as I used to. But, you know, it, it just has taken some of the enjoyment for me out of watching it. But when you get to the playoffs, it kind of tones down a little bit. But, I mean, watching regular yeah. season NBA basketball – it's it's background noise when I do watch it and I don't watch it as much anymore. But, you know, kudos to these kids making it work, you know, as, as far as being able to play uh, with that physique. You know, they'll fill out some, and I think they'll probably be even more effective as they do. But unless the rules change to go back to be to encouraging a more physical defensive mindset, they're going to be able to flourish their entire careers, probably. There's a video out there that basically shows high school kids at a high school team somewhere in America where they go to the inbound pass to half court. They shoot a half court shot, literally half court shot, and it goes in. Ball bounces on the ground, inbound pass. Other person takes it half court, shot goes in, ball bounces on the ground, inbound pass. Half court shot. Get, this goes out for like three or four times, and it's a viral video now. And it's like it goes to, it goes to that mentality that you were saying of how they are replicating what they're seeing. Where you know, you know, uh, Steph Curry. I mean, he can do that because he's a special talent, um, and he gets shots off really quickly. He's got a a release that's non traditional. It's it, he's not like he's squaring his feet, setting his um, setting his feet, getting his elbow. In between his, uh, you know, I guess his uh, uh, rib cage, square perpendicular to to his to his nose, up in the air, over. That takes time. Curry, he gets it off, and he's got that skill because he's been doing it all his life, and he's done it in a way that he's pretty much perfected it. So not everybody can shoot a, a shot like that and get it off that quickly. So, but these kids seeing that are mimicking it by shooting these distant shots because. He's such a good three point shooter. People are pushing out on him further. It means he had to shoot further out because he has to get space. And so these guys nowadays are seeing that and misinterpreting it in terms of, oh, I got to jack threes from half court. No, he's doing it because he's shorter. He can't get a shot off. He much prefer to shoot a layup. He just can't because they're on him like, you know, white on rice. So they're misinterpreting the data and they're, they're mimicking what they're seeing without actually doing it. So it's causing the game to be a lot less fun to watch because if you're just jacking half court threes, who cares? You must be playing NBA jam in 1994. So and that's kind of how I see mm -hmm. it. And, um, it, and I think playoff time, you mentioned it. I think when you have to get a basket, when it really counts, you're going to get closer to the basket because it's a higher percent shot regardless. So, and just like in football, when it comes to the playoffs, you're going to hit harder you're going to do that because it's a higher percentage play to run the ball for three yards than to pass the ball and hope you hope the guy catches it and not get intercepted. Or in hockey, you're going to block pucks in playoff because it's a higher percentage chance of winning because if they can't get the 
uh, puck into the net because your face is in the way, <laughs> then it, it limits the percentage of times you can get the goalie in trouble. So, so yeah, so it, it shakes itself out, but during the regular season, the fans ultimately lose out. I agree. So, okay. With that, um, we're going to uh, end this particular uh, podcast. This is episode eight of the Old Glory Games podcast. Um, for those of you guys who are watching us, we're on Spotify, Apple, and we're on Google, and we're on YouTube in the video format. So, Greg, close us out. All righty. So, uh, again, um, you know, thanks to everybody um, that are listening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. It's been uh a ball uh, doing this and talking sports and talk about things we love and care about. Um, <clears throat> watching these young players do what they do. I mean, they can do things that you've probably never seen before. I don't want to take anything away from their ability and their skill set. Uh, I'm just saying that the way the game is now with the rules and how it's played, it's easier for them uh, to get away with things that they would never get away with uh, in decades past. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point the NBA will try to do something to encourage more fundamentally sound play, but the NBA is about making money so and entertaining. So right. if they think that getting these kids in the league that are just physical specimens and phenoms, but, you know, uh, not much on the fundamentals, you know, whatever, if they're on ESPN every night and people are paying to see them, so be it, you know, their college and high school and AAU coaches, let them worry about fundamentals. But at the end of the day, I feel like the game overall suffers when you have uh, players that have all the physical talent in the world, but they're fundament fundamentally lacking. And that's why you see the kind of game you see now. But, you know, I think the NBA feels like that's a trade-off they're willing to make, and they're making it. But again, I hope that these guys can learn how to play the game you know, the right way, as Larry Brown uh, would famously say. But until then, I think we've got what we've got. And I'm not saying all of these young guys are fundamentally lacking, but, you know, I've watched a lot of basketball in my time at many different levels. And it's as lacking now as I've ever seen it. But I think, again, with the money that's being thrown around and the accolades and all that, What's compelling these guys to yeah, get center, better yeah, fundamentally? Not much. Yeah. So hopefully we can see a game that meets somewhere in the middle. I get it. You know, it's 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 entertainment. But for for us that are more or less purists or or closer to being purists than not, it's just not something that we particularly enjoy to watch. And I just watch it sporadically at this point when the playoffs come around I, I watch a little bit more of it but you know back when i was a kid i watched it every chance i got and it was just such a joy and so many great memories of, of watching basketball back then you know tell your kids yeah i watched dr j play on tv or i saw michael jordan play on tv and that sort of thing so but you know hopefully you know this new crop of talent can at some point make uh, similar memories for people and they can have long successful careers and hopefully the NBA, I don't mind it evolving and spreading globally. It already has, but, you know, go back to maybe some more fundamentally sound type play. Uh, I would like that much better, but you know, that's the grumpy old man and me talking, but, you know, I, I sure wish they'd play more like they did in, in, in the nineties. Same here. Same here. So yeah, thanks, Greg. That's perfect analysis and where perfect way to close this out. Um, for episode eight of the old glory games podcast, my name is Kyle. And of course that was Greg. And so again, if you guys like what you uh, see here, please comment, uh, send us email at 
podcast at theconservativetake.com. Let us know what you think. And with that, guys, we will be back with episode nine the following week. I'm not sure what the topic is going to be, but it sure should be stimulating because maybe we'll do something on, um, we'll figure something out. But when we do, we'll let you know. And with that, we'll see you guys in the next one.